Hello, and welcome to episode 144 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We are here today with Senator Rich Maddalino from District 18 of Montgomery County, Maryland, a Democrat who is the vice chair of the Budget and Taxation Committee. He's also a former delegate representing the same District 18. Rich, how are you doing today? I'm great, Jordan. How are you? Glad, I'm excellent. Glad to have you here. I'd like to ask your first question, which is, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? <laughs> I'd like to think I've done a lot to, to advance the, the public interest mm-hmm. and the interest of the people of District 18, Montgomery County, and Maryland. Mm-hmm. So, of course, right now in the middle of the 2017 legislative session, we're working on a range of issues mm-hmm. that I think are important for our community with a focus on, first and foremost, how do we... How do we create jobs? How do we lay the groundwork for a successful, um, prosperous community mm-hmm. um, in much the same way that prior generations of people in this community and this state laid the groundwork for us? Now, the Montgomery County, Maryland, although increasingly uh, now it's majority minority and there's an increasing variety of uh, across the socioeconomic spectrum, is widely regarded, contains some of the most prosperous communities in the United States. Mm -hmm. To what extent um, is it the role or is it even possible for the state legislature to help create, to help a community become more prosperous on the one hand? On the other hand, you know, given that we already have so many prosperous communities, what is it that you're trying to do? So, um, when I talk about Montgomery County, I I like to to refer to it as a non-majority community because it really is mm-hmm. there there is no majority mm-hmm. i mean there's there are there are U- european descendants there mm-hmm. are hispanic descendants there are african descendants there are asian descendants mm-hmm. i mean there 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 is a wide range of people mm-hmm. um, from all over the world some whose whose families go back centuries mm-hmm. in this community in this country and some who just arrived here in the last few months or years mm-hmm. so it is it is a diverse, amazing community that I think reflects the the future of humanity mm-hmm. of us all coming together and finding successful ways to live together and work together. Uh, the one thing that I think people in Montgomery County realized long ago mm-hmm. was that the success of this community depends upon our single greatest resource, and that's our residents, hmm. our people. This is not a part of the country that has natural resources, right? It's a nice place to live. It, it's a beautiful community. Mm-hmm. We're not sitting on oil. We're not sitting on gold. Mm-hmm. What we're sitting on is the most valuable resource, people. Mm-hmm. Smart, energetic, and inquisitive and inventive people. Mm-hmm. And how do you make sure that community of people succeeds. I think you do that through what I would broadly call infrastructure, Mm -hmm. both the educational infrastructure and the physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You need to have a great school system and a great academic community Mm -hmm. that helps young people develop the skills Mm -hmm. and helps adults continue to refine their skills for their entire life because clearly in the 21st century that the idea of constant reinvention Mm -hmm. and improvement is going to be essential to success and then you need to have the roads the water the the electricity the broadband all of those things that are essential to keeping the tools that are necessary for success Mm -hmm. as well as are um, critical to quality of life so, so you're and you're a budget expert. So actually, it's not just enumerating priorities for this community, but it's figuring out how to pay for them. So, can you speak a little bit? You began as a legislative staffer, uh, working on the budget for the Maryland General Assembly, and now are widely considered to be one of the most preeminent budget experts in the state legislature. Can you speak about? Um, how you how you developed your budget expertise and and how that's relevant to developing adequate intellectual and physical infrastructure to serve your community. Well, I think part of it is just repetition. <laughs> you know, I had I had a chance to 
um, start working for the legislature right out of grad school. Mm -hmm. Um, I started as a budget analyst. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, my first job was to dig into the weeds of two state agencies and understand, you know, the reams of paperwork that goes into their annual submission and how the budget is built Mm -hmm. and how it's categorized and how to find money, um, in the but how to identify money in the budget and what it's being spent on. So mm-hmm. um, part of it is I feel like I I have a advantage on many of my colleagues because I had to start in the trenches of the budget. So it gives you a better understanding of 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 how to look at the the big picture. Yeah. So so you're on the budget and taxation committee. You're the vice chair, uh-huh. and that background gives you a unique perspective. How would you say, I guess, how does that, how do your other colleagues approach, I guess, what kind of edge does it give you when you're present, when you're working with the budget and you have all this background, I guess, how does that help you? For instance, let's look at some of your signature issues. You've worked on passing marriage equality and the death penalty and firearm regulations. How, how has your expertise in uh, working on the budget helped you advance those kinds of issues? Well... In the end, the budget is a piece of legislation. Okay. So you learn the legislative process at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you learn how to build. And with my role, you know, after I worked for the legislature, I worked for the county government. Mm-hmm. And part of my responsibilities with the county government was working to advocate for the county priorities in Annapolis. You build coalitions. You build allies. You find common interests. Mm-hmm. Um, and you try to put together... Uh, a strategy that gets you um, where you want to go with with whatever your priorities are. So um, I do think that staff background, because I went from, I was originally a budget analyst, then I went into a committee staff role. Mm-hmm. You, you got to understand another set of issues and understand the legislative process. Right. So it just... I, I, it's I a think unique I just, background to have been able to be to have come up from the ground up to become a senator. Yeah, but the the, the interesting thing is um, a name that maybe many people are familiar with, Mike Miller, yeah. the current president of the state senate. Mm-hmm. He actually started his career as a legislative staff person. He was the staff person to the Prince George's delegation in the mid nineteen sixties. So Nancy Cop, who's another name that many people in this area will recognize, the, the treasurer. Current state treasurer. Mm-hmm. Um, she actually started uh, in Annapolis as a staff person of the Montgomery County delegation in the nineteen seventies. Hmm. So before eventually getting elected to the to the House of Delegates. So um, it is not an unusual it is not an unusual path. Uh-huh. Um, I think it does give you an advantage because, in one way, I mean, not to not to joke too much about it, but you know where everything is when you get to Annapolis. You don't you, you know where to go find find things, and sometimes more importantly, you know who to go to 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 find things. So you are a little uh, more independent. Right. And trying to do other some pressure. of your research than other than the new members who are who are learning their way. And mm-hmm. I think one of one of my skills mm-hmm. um, is I, I've been willing to help newer colleagues right. learn those things. How to navigate an apple. Yes. So a lot of individuals have the opinion that the budget is all numbers and is somewhat boring, but you're an expert on it. How were you able to maintain your attention on the budget? I mean, how were you able to grow and gain expertise in something that seems quite dry to many of your colleagues? Um, I, I often joke that uh, the legislature is filled with people who are afraid of numbers. Uh-huh. You know, that, the, the, type of, the type of person who I think um, politics... Um, and especially electoral politics Mm -hmm. appeals to Mm -hmm. aren't necessarily people who are really interested in numbers. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, the budget, and remember in Maryland, we pass a budget every year. Mm -hmm. That is the most important policy document of the state. It's, it is where you establish your priorities because the legislature you, you can, has a constitutional power to tax and then to spend those tax dollars. That's basically why it exists. Yeah. And that's what the budget is concerned with. And and it but it it's also funding your priorities. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, our our um, law books mm-hmm. 
are filled with programs mm-hmm. and laws that if there's not money behind them mm-hmm. to support them or enforce them, yeah. that they have little impact. So, for instance, you could say it's against the law to go faster than the speed limit on the highway, but if you don't fund any police officers to patrol the highway, then effectively there is no speed limit. Correct. And we, you know, we have a number of... Um, scholarship programs that have been created over the years mm-hmm. for a variety of, of, of reasons. Mm-hmm. And if there's not money behind those scholarship programs, they're, they're not helping anyone go to school. So it, it's one of those things of, of your, the, the, the budget mm-hmm. is the central policy document now, of, of the year. As I alluded to earlier, you do have some, have had some great legislative accomplishments that have been hallmark achievements that have been reflected actually and have reverberated around the nation. Can you speak for a moment about your work on marriage equality, ending the death penalty on firearm regulation, or any other hallmark uh, achievements that you've had in the state legislature? Um, I, I would I would say I would say that um, like with marriage equality um, mm-hmm. It's not just marriage equality. I, when, I mean, it's amazing to see, for example, um, in 2000, not mm-hmm. that long ago, mm-hmm. in 2000, the only mention of the LGBT community in state law mm-hmm. was to criminalize our existence. Was it the anti-sodomy laws to criminalize specific acts? Yes. Okay. So... Um, and that didn't even directly mention people of, of particular no, sexual orientation. It, no, it was, it, it, to be to be clear, it was to be to be clear, it was um, interestingly the law um, was clear and it covered a range of activities, no matter who was participating. in And that. it could have applied to However, heterosexual. And- it could have, but there was a court case in right. Maryland years earlier that that specified it didn't apply. Right. To consensual heterosexual behavior, so Texas, so, there was a Supreme Court case in that Texas came later. Right, okay. that that all that all came later. Mm-hmm. So, so the amazing thing is, is it was like Jim Crow. It was that it wasn't separate but equal. It was it was a law that in on the books applied to everybody, and we're talking about particular sexual acts, but in practice was meant to just discriminate against a particular group of people. Right. So. Um, so the amazing thing is, in a short period of time, um, we went from having no protections mm-hmm. in Maryland. And who is we, by the way? We, the LGBT community, of again, which... lesbian community, of which I'm a part. Okay. Um, we wound up moving from, and we as Maryland, I think we should be proud, from having absolutely no protections to now having um, amongst the most comprehensive um, laws in the country to provide equality for the gay community. Right. So we've passed, um, and I, I'm proud I've played a role in all of it and mm-hmm. helping to, to, to devise this strategy to keep us moving forward. Um, an anti discrimination law mm-hmm. and housing, employment, and public accommodations mm-hmm. that included at first just sexual orientation, that later was. Um, expanded to include gender identity, um, a hate crimes law mm-hmm. that includes sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as a number of other classifications, an anti-bullying law, a procurement law, and then finally, um, several years of working on relationship recognition to eventually get to full marriage equality. And we were the we were the first state to pass marriage equality Mm -hmm. without um, having either our high court, Mm -hmm. which in in Maryland we don't call it the Supreme Court, we call it the Court of Appeals, without having the court demand action, Mm -hmm. require action as had happened in several other states, or by first kind of doing that pit stop at civil unions. Uh So um, it was a, a lengthy but smart process to figure out how many years did it take how um it took us six years 
But and how many years does it typically take to get a piece of legislation passed? It really depends on the substance of the legislation. I mean, I, I think the anti-discrimination bill, which I mentioned first, which uh-huh. passed in 2001, yeah. um, that had taken um, almost 20 years to, to pass. So um, depending upon the, the issue, it can go, it can take a long time to get uh, an issue passed. But, you know, it was trying to be smart about the politics, trying mm-hmm. to be smart about the legislative strategy, trying to be smart about the strategy outside of Annapolis, yeah. and trying to be smart about the electoral strategy to get us moving to the point where um, we could get the votes, get the commitments, and get the bill passed. And then, of course... Um, we had to deal with it on referendum, and we were the the first state to pass it on on referendum. So clearly, there are many pieces of legislation um, that you work on that advance the public interest as you see it um, that you benefit from. For instance, in having firearm regulations, it may be your opinion that you're making the community safer, not only for other people but also for yourself. But on the other hand, this marriage equality bill clearly hit close to home for you. You know, you're still a member of the community who would, in your opinion, benefit from tighter firearm regulations. But but here there's a particular identity that had been discriminated against historically and now is being recognized and, and civil rights are being granted to individuals in the LGBT community. Does that, did that, how did that play out differently in the state legislature? Did people respect you more in this issue, defer to your expertise? Did people allow you to take leadership positions because you're a part of this community? Did they think that you had less legitimacy than you did on, the, on, on, on ending the death penalty because this is something where you personally had something to gain? What were the political dynamics of actually being a member of a group who would benefit from this piece of legislation? Well, um, A, I think... All of us have a lot to gain on gun violence prevention. <laughs> you know, I, all of us have our own lives, our loved ones. I mean, I, I think we all benefit from a, a, a safer community. Um, we all benefit from a smarter community. Right. We all benefit from um, a happier, more stable community. And mm-hmm. that was part of marriage equality was demonstrating to people about how important marriage is for stable families and how important stable families are for the health of the entire community. Right. So, you know, I, I think part of it, and it, you know, it wasn't just me. There are there are, um, last term when we were dealing with this issue on marriage, there were um, eight openly gay members of the House and the Senate, mm-hmm. seven in the House and me in the Senate. Mm-hmm. I think in some ways, like has been true on issue after issue in American history, people are sometimes just reticent, sometimes fearful of something different, of someone different, a different religion, a different color, a different language, a different orientation. And it's getting to know those people that those differences and that that the fear of that difference slowly melts away. So, I mean, for for me, I think it was, you know, being there to talk to people, to answer questions, to see how both loving and mundane my own marriage is mm-hmm. <laughs> compared to them. That that in the end, it is a lot about. Who's doing the chores? <laughs> you know, who, who's got to do the dishes? Who cooks? Mm-hmm. Balancing all the life decisions that any married couple goes through. So I, I think it was, um, p- part of it, it was the, the example that we all could show mm-hmm. um, to the members and I think uh, to my colleagues. And I think it was also so many other communities um, that so many other so many other people um, coming out in mm-hmm. their own community and with their own legislators and and seeing you know seeing just how um, how how diverse the LGBT community is how spread out it is around the state you know so um, I think people people started to see it in a different light. So through exposure, there's acculturation, and through acculturation, there's respect and understanding and a diminishment of fear? Uh, 
Yes, that is a far more scientific way to put it. But yes, there, <laughs> there is. But I mean, uh, uh, familiarity often um, breeds comfort. That's you know, the premise as, of this show. In fact, I'm hoping that individuals who do not have as much exposure to difference are able to experience difference. And even yourself, uh, I have some conservative. Republicans or, or non-political individuals on this show that hopefully uh, some of your strongest liberal progressive supporters may listen to and, and learn something about. I have heard the story of former Congressman Barney Frank, and now he was a gay legislator in the Massachusetts state legislature, or then the U.S. Congress, um, without uh, openly admitting it mm -hmm. for some time. You are now an openly gay senator. Mm -hmm. But it were you well, according to Barney Frank's memoirs, he was fearful that he would never get elected if he were openly in public who he privately felt himself to be. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a concern that if you were openly who you are, that you might not be able to get the votes to win? So I remember um, when Barney Frank came out, mm -hmm. he was already a member of the Congress. And mm -hmm. I remember um, now this might be shocking to some of the younger people that were sitting here talking on a podcast and, um, and recording, but there was a time when in order to read an article in the newspaper, you had to go to the library <laughs> to do that. There, there was no internet to just yeah. look it up. So when the Boston Globe ran the huge article about him coming out, mm -hmm. um, I, was a, I was a college student at the time, so I went to my college library mm -hmm. and got out the, the, um, the newspaper mm -hmm. And read the whole article, and it was interesting. I, I, I grew up fascinated by politics. I'm sure, much like you, um, volunteered in campaigns, always participated. You know, thought at one time I would, you know, at one point in my life, I, I thought I would run for office. So, and I, and I just remember. So I was. I was actually president of the student body at Syracuse University. I was certainly not out then. And I remember how fearful I was. Did you have a girlfriend? Of, no. So you were no, just, I, but you I was single. single. I had, yes. So, um, and I, I remember how fearful I was of, you know, oh, would, would it, you know, one day the campus newspaper run a story? Or yeah. What, what would happen? Yeah. Um, and... I don't know exactly why or how, um, but from early on I decided if I ever ran for office, I would only do it as an openly gay person. Hmm. I wouldn't want to deal with all of the added anxiety of, of what would happen, what if the secret comes out. And, you know, as a, as a staff person in Annapolis, you know, being around Annapolis, not as a legislator, mm -hmm. I could... I could see the, the the closeted gay people that were that were there. Oh, you and, you knew and there and were the, people the, who were elected the, who were gay. Yes, and the and the the battles that they fought internally. You know, I could, I, I you know, you could hear the comments that other people said behind their back. So it wasn't about, really a secret. It. So if no, for some people, I mean, it just yeah. There were just more rumors, and I just, I didn't want to live with any of that. So I always made myself a promise that if I did it, I would only do it as an openly gay person. When and I, I just felt like things changed enough, and it's certainly in a place like Montgomery County, mm -hmm. that you could, you could do that. So when a vacancy arose in District 16 for a delegate position, 18. in District 18 for a delegate position, um, you were able... You felt that society was ready for you to be openly gay and run for office and win. Yes. That I thought it was, we, we had moved beyond, certainly in, in a Democratic primary in mm -hmm. Montgomery County, mm -hmm. um, we, had, we had moved beyond that being um, an issue. Now, continuing on the topic of identities, but segueing a little bit away from your orientation to your political orientation... Your father is not of the same political persuasion as you, correct? Now, a lot of times in, in America, throughout the world, someone gets their political opinions. Often, it's strongly correlated with their parents' political mm -hmm. opinions. How is it that you were able to develop into a progressive Democrat 
coming from a household that has a military background and, and, and leans to the right instead of the left. Um, I, interestingly, I would say about my my parents, my mm -hmm. parents are both from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, they happen to move here and I grew up in Silver Spring. Mm -hmm. So um, I always, how, how I often talk about my father's political philosophy, um, he is a traditional Northeastern Republican, mm -hmm. libertarian. Mm -hmm. Little government means stay out of my business, stay out of my personal life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a philosophy for, for both of my parents. They were, they were very comfortable with Connie Morella mm -hmm. and that type of... Who's a former congressman, congressman, woman, and a former guest on this podcast. So they were very... Com um, they liked her a lot and her philosophy mm -hmm. a lot. I think for both of them, the Republican Party left them mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as it veered further to the, to the right. Um, my my parents are both pro-choice. Mm -hmm. Don't see it as a government that the government should be involved one mm -hmm. way or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously that's not the their the current, that's not the current philosophy of certainly of the Republican Party. So, um, you know, I think it was the combination of of growing up here mm -hmm. and and actually, um, so for high school, well, I. Well, most of my academic career was in the Montgomery County Public Schools. For high school, my parents decided that I should go to Georgetown Prep hmm. in North Bethesda, which is a Jesuit, Catholic Jesuit school. Mm -hmm. And um, the Jesuits push the um, a philosophy of being a man for others. And they made us... Before it was common practice, mm -hmm. we had a service requirement mm -hmm. in order to graduate. Mm -hmm. And so for much of my senior year, every Sunday morning, I had to get up and go down to a soup kitchen downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of when the homeless, the issue of homelessness was, was first hitting everyone's consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I went down and I worked the breakfast shift at So Others Might Eat, which is still... Uh, a um, very qualified health center and a a, a um, food pantry and a soup kitchen and all of those things that's still in existence mm -hmm. um, downtown mm -hmm. and and to work you know that breakfast shift and meet those people and meet the people who are in the kitchen and meet the people who you are serving and and yeah I mean to me it it, it just taught you. To open your eyes, to challenge your assumptions, mm -hmm. and to think about how the the world can be a, made a better place. So, so to me, I think it was that it was that experience that that really said, "All right, you you've got to just because you were told this was the way." Mm -hmm you need to make those decisions for yourself. I mean, one of the things that I think is amazing, this is a horrible digression about Jesuit education, mm -hmm. is, their, is their ultimate confidence in Catholic theology that they will get you to question it mm -hmm. and that you will come back to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, which hasn't worked for me. But um, the, and I, and I think, well, I, I think... Catholic philosophy has changed in a lot of ways, but I, I think it was that background that made me challenge um, my my own assumptions and to think about how do we build a uh, a better world and what role do you have in it to be uh, a good person for others. And so, as we approach the end of this podcast, and I ask a final question about. I'd like to ask you to elaborate on that and say, you know, in making the world a better place for others, is that like, what's how have these varied experiences been driving you both as a desire? As you said, uh, Barney Frank was a role model, role model for you. Perhaps you had a desire to be a role model for others more locally, you know, challenging basic assumptions and being able to uh, find empathy and compassion for your fellow man in the soup kitchen and, and how that may have reverberated elsewhere in your life. Take a moment and speak about why you've given a lot of yourself to public service throughout the course of your life, 
and at the end of the day, what you hope your legacy will be uh, after you have spent a lifetime in public service? Well, I don't know if I'm going to spend a lifetime in public service, but <laughs> for my work so far, far thank you. Um, I do, I do think one of the one of the messages that I got as a as a young person um, from my family was you you do have a responsibility. All of us have a responsibility to leave this place better off than we found it. I, mean, I think that's part of human nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have found that work through government is one of the ways that we can do the, the, the most good um, for our community and for our, our fellow people. Um, and, and to me, there's a, there's a, um, there's a wonderful mural that's on the wall of the headquarters building of the Associated Jewish Charities of Baltimore. And it shows all of the different, um, community assets from the, that the Jewish community has, has built over time. The, mm -hmm. the hospitals, the community centers, the, um, the schools and and the message is our parents built for us we build for our children hmm. and to me that's the fundamental thing of our our parents their parents they built for us and it's our responsibility to build for others um, for our own children and for other young people and the generations to come our families for for many of us who are the who are the descendants of immigrants mm -hmm. um, that freely came here? Mm -hmm. You know, they the families. Someone made a decision that this was going to be a better opportunity for for them and for their descendants. And to me, that's part of the American experience. You you have that responsibility to keep that going and going not just for yourself or not just for your small circle of friends and family but larger for the, for the community. And I think sometimes in this political environment today, we're getting away from that because it seems that sometimes we drift to, it's all about what I'm getting as opposed to what am I doing for everyone else. And that has been Senator Rich Maddalino, uh, Senator, a state Senator representing uh, District 18 in Montgomery County, Maryland, the Vice Chair of Budget and Taxation Committee and a former delegate representing District 18, who speaks about um, compassion with almost a utilitarian approach. He says that we must do the most good for the most amount of people. He, he recognizes that investments in infrastructure and in educational infrastructure and in physical infrastructure are um, investments that we make in ourselves, but in the rest of the community. He acknowledges that any success that we might find is a success that is partially the fruit of others' labors, regardless of whether you were educated in a private school and you took a public road to drive there, um, or whether you're educated in a public school at the benefit of someone else's tax dollars. Rich is somebody who has learned the budget inside and out in a state legislature in order to fund his priorities appropriately and, and, and the state's priorities appropriately. But he reminds us of uh, a need to serve future generations and to acknowledge that we are the beneficiaries of the efforts and, and investments of so many others who came before us that it is incumbent upon us to perpetuate um, the process of improving society for everyone and that um, a more recent trend of retreating into more parochial identities uh, is to the detriment of all and that we must really see ourselves as an interconnected community um, within this great nation and this wider world. So, Richard, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. I'm thrilled. Thank you, Jordan, for doing it. It was fun to chat with you. And this has been episode 144 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. I remind you to subscribe at publicinterestpodcast.com, listen on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, Player FM, 
Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Should you wish to leave a voicemail for Rich, you can call 240-630-0380, and a voicemail will be emailed to him. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.